In 1999, Apple's iBook series were some of the first devices to adopt the wireless standard known as Wi-Fi. But the underlying technology which made it all possible began as early as the 1970s. With the advent of the transistor, computers were slowly becoming more common in places like universities and research centers, and the desire to share information among these machines would give way to computer networks. For the networks, copper cables were the connection of choice. But in situations where running cables was not feasible, other options needed to be leveraged. By the mid-20th century, radio technology was maturing. With a transmitter and receiver, information can travel great distances using electromagnetic waves. So in 1971, when a new computer network, AlohaNet, needed to span the Great Hawaiian Islands, it was decided that some of the connections would be wireless, relying on the UHF band of the electromagnetic spectrum. AlohaNet would become the foundation for future technologies, the likes of Ethernet, and yes, Wi-Fi. In 1985, the FCC ruled to release the ISM band for unlicensed use. The frequencies ranging in the 2.4 GHz band cannot travel very far and are prone to interference, making them ideal for use in household products like microwave ovens and later wireless access points. The precursor to Wi-Fi, or as IEEE designation 802.11, came in 1991. Waveland, as it was known, was invented by NRC and AT&T and was intended for cashier systems. Vicase, an employee at NRC, will go on to help establish the IEEE 802.11 standard for wireless local area networks, which will later earn him the title father of Wi-Fi. The next step in the evolution of wireless communication would be something that the courts would later have to decide. Up until this point, wireless tech was bulky, taking up the entirety of a small laboratory. This was a far cry from what is used in today's devices. In 1992, and then again in 1996, Cicero, an Australian research organization, filed patents for a technology it was using to detect exploding mini black holes. Many early Wi-Fi adopters would use these patents to design wireless chips that were small enough to fit in a portable device like a laptop without paying any royalties. It would take over a decade for this situation to be resolved and for Cicero to be reimbursed for the infringements on his patents. But before all of this, in 1999, the Wi-Fi Alliance was formed. It placed a more marketable face on the 802.11 designation and set wireless standards that companies must adhere to in order to carry the Wi-Fi brand. With the Wi-Fi label, customers were now confident that their devices would be compatible regardless of manufacturer. As for what came next, well, that's just history.